stuff. Um, and I'm going to be kind of chairing, if that's the right word, and uh, compare, perhaps will be a better one, uh, for this symposium. And um, what I'd like to do just to start off with is uh, to think about data science just quickly. Think about what do we mean by uh, data science, and what do we mean by data science, okay? So for me, and we might have to just shuffle just slightly the seat, so we'll play around slightly here. Um, it's, it's thinking about data as a research substrate, data as a science utility, data as a commodity, and data as infrastructure. So that's what it means for me. And there's a lot of talk about data scientists, about there being a shortage of data scientists, but, you know, for, for me, there's no one definition of a data scientist, and I think there's a whole family of roles, and it's something I'd like us to explore this afternoon. So there are lots of different flavours of data scientists, so let me share with you what I think some of those flavours are. So here we go, um, and this is where it starts to get interactive. So. How many people um, out there think you're a data engineer? Chop your hands up. Right, have a look round. We've got a few data engineers there. Yeah, okay. Uh, data analyst. How many people think they're a data analyst? Yeah, we've got a panel member who thinks they're a data analyst. That's terrific. Okay, data librarian. Ooh, look at that. Lots of data librarians. Uh, data steward. Okay, quite a lot of data stewards. Wonderful. Uh, data journalist. How many data journalists? There's some half hands going up there. Data journalists. Yeah, okay. Data publisher. We've got some data publishers here, yeah. Wonderful. So, so, so that for me just um, immediately illustrates the diversity and variety around this, this term data scientist. And that's something that I think we're going to explore more. Um, uh, I should say that that's um, uh, Joe Thorpe, and he calls himself uh, a data artist, uh, which is uh, another version, if you like. He works at the New York Times and provides these wonderful visualizations uh, in, in his story. So lots of different flavors of data scientists. And we are very privileged to have um, four data scientists here um, who are gonna share with us their thoughts. And then we're gonna flip it around and see where we can get to and um, thinking about what we need to do uh, as a community uh, to build capacity for data science uh, and what we need to do as a community in terms of skills development for data scientists and perhaps how we're going to resource that as well. So um, we've got four data scientists here, uh, Steph, Louise, Scott, and Fran. And I'd like to invite Steph uh, to say a few words now um, to kick off uh, this next uh, part of this session. So over to you, Steph. So uh, my title, actual formal title, is Data Services Coordinator whatever that means, um, and I'll get to that in a bit. So I became intrigued by the term data scientist when Liz gave a um, presentation at the eScience workshop hosted by Microsoft in Chicago last October. And she, along with the slide where she showed the different family roles in the family of data scientists, she also put up several slides that showed what some of the responsibilities were for people who fell under that term of data scientist. And as I was reading one of those slides, the list that she had sounded very similar to what I was doing, which kind of caught me off guard because I've never thought of myself as a data scientist. Um, so then she showed that slide that she showed you all where she listed data librarian as one of those facets in the set of roles that could be defined as data scientist. And I never thought of data librarian as falling under the umbrella term of data scientist. And I think probably because there's that disciplinary association with the word scientist. And I spend no small part of my time at home trying to convince people that my position is discipline agnostic. 
So I don't serve just social sciences, I don't just serve humanities, I don't just serve sciences, I serve everybody. Um, I do this explanation not just to the researchers and students that I serve, but I'm also spending a lot of time trying to convince the subject librarians that I work with that I am discipline agnostic. I don't know, uh, within that I try to define data very broadly. I don't know that I'm succeeding in, in uh, letting people know that I define data broadly because we recently distributed a research data management needs survey to several, to, to over 3,000 researchers, PIs, uh, across our campus. And we had over 320 responses, so that's more than 10% response rate. I don't really care about the response rate so much as the actual numbers. But 70% of those were from the health sciences. I have a real hard time getting social sciences and humanities folks to respond to the survey because they didn't identify what they were doing as um, something that required research data management needs feedback to me. Um, I found out that the li subject librarians that I reached out to to distribute the survey also were not sharing it because they thought that their subjects were not related to research data management needs. I think part of that confusion um, rests in the term data librarianship <laughs> itself. There, first off, when you think of data librarians, someone wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be a data librarian. There is no set educational route or career path for having such a position. Um, I have many colleagues that I consider data librarians, and when I talk to them, they have come here from every kind of background. I have some friends who have come from the IT route. There are some who had subject-specific um, library positions before and have moved into data librarianship, such as government documents librarians. Um, there are also some data librarians who are former researchers themselves. I myself, I came from libraries assessment, where I was tasked with managing the data that the libraries collected about itself. Now, when I was in library school, there was no such thing as a data science certificate, a data creation certificate, but that has changed in recent years. Um, there are some cert certificate and degree programs out there, Syracuse, University of Illinois, University of North Carolina, I know there are more, um, but those are just a few off the top of my head. Also, many iSchools, even if they aren't offering certificates or degree programs, they offer courses that are related to data curation. So one thing that I'm really particularly interested in seeing in the future is how the data libraries that come out of those programs differ in their skills and their abilities compared to those of us who kind of blazed our trail and a meandering path to get to where we are right now. Another part of the confusion as to um, what is a data librarian is that we all have different titles. And I'm not sure that all of them actually reflect what it is we do. There's the generic data librarian title. There is um, some that are more specific. Geospatial and social science data specialist is one that I've seen. Most recently, I saw one that was competitive research and analysis librarian. Okay. Um, we all have different responsibilities, as Liz indicated in her slides at the presentation that I saw. Some only deal with services that are related to certain data formats, like GIS. There are others who have more of a computing systems bent, and they're focused on the technology behind the data services. So it's no surprise to me that whenever I introduce myself and I say I'm the data services coordinator at the University of Washington, the automatic follow-up question is, so what exactly is it that you do? And the term that I like best, and I think that best describes what I'm doing, and it is actually, um, it was coined by one of the associate deans at my library, and it's actually in my job description, is that of data concierge. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like this term, number one, it sounds nice. Um, number two, it's not um, associated with any discipline. And, um, I really like part of the definition that you'll find in the Wikipedia definition of concierge. And here I'm going to quote Wikipedia, don't get mad at me, um, and it's going to be an abbreviated version because it was, of course, a really big definition. But what they said was a concierge is often expected to achieve the impossible, <laughs> um, also relying on an extensive list of contacts with local merchants and service providers. And that, for the most part, is what I do as a data librarian. Um, 
So I will wholeheartedly support a page from the Monash Doctrine that they um, talked about earlier in today's presentations, and that I don't like to reinvent the wheel. Not only do I think it's inefficient to um, duplicate effort, I don't want to take away any services that other people are willing to do. And until recently, I was the only person in the entire Adobe library system where data services was a specific job responsibility. So I'm more than happy to let other people take on some of those tasks. So for the first year that I was in this position, I spent a lot of time reaching out and discovering who on our widely, um, what's the word I'm looking for, decentralized campus to discover who was doing data um, and what services they provided. And so now I spend my time connecting people who are just now realizing that they have research data management needs to those experts on our campus, such as those people that are in our recently formed eSciences Institute. We also have our Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, who have put together a catalog called the Global Health Digital Exchange or Data Exchange, GHDX. We also have a center on campus called the Center for Social Science Computing and Research. So we have different disciplines that have already created their own groups that um, provide some of those data management services. I also link to external services, um, resources, such as those that were provided by California Digital Library, which we heard about earlier today, uh, UK Data Archive. I link to a lot of your resources. Thank you, Louise. Um, the uh, Digital Curation Center, love the DMP tool, and um, that came out of there. And I do all this linking through a online resource that we created called the Data, our Data Management Guide, which I think just about every library, uh, at least institutional libraries, is putting together now. And the three most valuable skills I think that I have for this job are number one, my project management skills, my lack of shyness, some would say persistence, um, at reaching out and making new contacts, and my ability and willingness to speak different dialects of research, whether that's from the sciences, the humanities, or the social sciences. And all of those fall under the category of things I did not learn in library school. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to um, put forward the position of a data curator. I'm not sure if that's what I'm called. I could be a data steward, a curator, I could be called many things, but actually my title is Director of Collections Development and Producer Relations. So I've got quite a, a functional title. But I think the title is very interesting. I think none of us quite know what we do in terms of our job class. My husband certainly doesn't know what I do for a living. He's GP, it's very easy to understand. My job is much harder to understand. So um, I'm going to posit the question, are we data scientists? Um, I'm first of all thinking about, you know, the data scientist, if you look around the press at the moment, is the sexiest job, we're short of them. It's a really good thing to be, but we're still quite, not quite sure what, what this thing is. It seems to me that actually the data scientist label in mind is someone who's really good at, at looking at the challenges of big data, finding pathways through data, mixing and matching huge data sets, and that's the term that's kind of been coined. And a, a, when I looked at an article last week, they mentioned multiple petabytes of data, which is an extreme amount of data. So that's quite an interesting kind of thing to start with. Um, just going back to my own organisation from the UK Data Archive, we, we're not, we just certainly don't have any big data. In fact, we have, compared to that, very, very small data. So I just thought I'd start by giving you just a, a kind of some figures about the capacity. So we've got about 6,000 studies. We have 1.632 gigabytes, which isn't very much. Uh, sorry, 1.632 uh, gigabytes. Um, our, our average file size is actually quite small, so relatively small data, actually, in, in terms of a big data challenge. So I'm now going to present you with our, our lovely open archival information system that we all love, and anyone who works in a data centre is probably adopting this model. This is the way that our whole organisation is framed, and, and these are the kind of sections in which we work. But I took the model, and I thought, well, where do the data skills come into play here? So just to take you through um, some of the areas, we have some pre-ingest. This is the work that's done to negotiate data sets before they come in. Ingest is where you're actually working on, 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 on documenting them, getting them ready, then you've got your data management, then you've got your supply side. And out of interest, um, we did start to call some of our team ingest officers, and they really complained about the term, because it sounded like they were in charge of feeding live mice to, to pythons, but actually they, they refused to use the term, and now they're called curators, out of interest. 
Um, so if you, I'm just thinking about the, the kind of domain specific skills if you look at our model. Um, data appraisal certainly does require some kind of data skills if you're looking over a data set with someone, you're looking at the variables in there, you're looking at confidentiality, you're making a, a, a kind of um, informed decision about whether it's going to be useful or not, and that quite often involves opening the files, looking at them, and doing that kind of thing. So they're definitely um, domain data skills are very important. Um, in terms of data management training, we do a lot of that. The people who are sent out to train all have quite strong data skills and understand the language of research. Um, when it comes to licensing and description, I think there's less of a need, certainly in our organisation, to have strong social science skills, but there's certainly awareness of those skills. Um, data handling, all of our ingest officers are highly skilled uh, postgraduates. They, they, they can open data files, they can manipulate them, they can do things with them. And again, um, people who work in transformation, that's a very specific skill to maybe migrate data sets to different formats, to check to make sure that they're not, they're not broken when they're transformed. It's a very specific um, type of activity. People engaging in data analysis, supporting users to go out and teach with data, again, they do have to have those data skills. And then people who are in charge of vetting outputs from our secure data service have very strong uh, data analysis skills because they need to check whether the outputs are disclosed or not. So, some of the other areas, we have a lot of technical expertise in there where people don't have data skills, but just thinking about the term data science, I'm not sure whether we do truly have any data scientists in our centre. Um, so thinking about that, those roles I've showed you are all fairly discrete roles. There's not one person that does many of them, but people are quite confined to the kind of work that they do. Um, most of the people who do interact with the data do have postgraduate qualifications in social science, most of them are PhDs and they've probably come straight from their PhDs as a first job. Some of them have had some research experience. Um, we do have, I think, one person, or we always have had one person who I think is, is a proper data scientist. And they're the people who we use to transform data. They use scripting, they have a very good knowledge of, of analytic tools, and they can open data and be very familiar with it. And they're the guys we, or they're the people we use to, to, to look at this kind of transformation. Also, the people who are linking data, bringing different data sets in, manipulating them, looking at harmonised data sets <laughs> across different countries to make sure that they're, they're um, um, comparable, requires a really quite a, a, a significant amount of, of data expertise, even though it's still quite small data. Um, and so thinking about these guys, they are guys, actually, and there's only ever been one at a time. Um, they're definitely data geeks, and when I asked one of them, do you think you're a data geek? He said, that's definitely what I am. I'm one of those things. I'm very proud of being that. Um, they tend to be <laughs> highly intelligent, very, very bright people, who um, have all done early career research, but also um, have had quite a lot of experience in analysing data. So they tend to write academic articles as well. Um, they're very database programming curious. They picked up really good technical skills, not scared to, you know, install servers and do things, and they tend to pick them up, not necessarily from formal training, but along the way. And they've probably done it since the age of seven, failing and hacking and all those kinds of things. So um, those kind of database skills they, they have. Um, in terms of curation skills, we've never been we've never sent any staff on, on curation training. We've kind of picked it up as we've gone along from the expertise of the center, the documentation that we have that's very rigorous, and also going to find out more about digital preservation from um, you know, from, from Williams' unit, so there's very good training there. But on the whole, we picked up these metadata and preservation skills along the way. Um, we have one or two librarians in there who do, you know, work with controlled vocabularies, but on the whole, um, they, they kind of train us on what to do. And we do have uh, how to run a data service that we've been running for a few years internally, so all our staff come in and find out exactly what each section does, and they learn quite a bit. And we started to, um, to promote that more. We, have, uh, we train about 20 people a year on bringing them in and letting them see exactly what we do. And it's really one of the best ways to learn, showing, taking people through the life of the data set so they can see what happens in, in real detail. And then just finally, really, I want to talk about training. Um, if you go on the internet, there's hundreds of courses on how to be a data scientist. It's really, you know, it, it's a lot of money to be made. And when I was looking at them, I mean, don't worry about the, the terms. It's, it's, it's a whole new discipline, data science. And, you know, there's a big data university, which I found out about, I'm sure it's a commercial enterprise. Um, but it's all about training in kind of abstract big science techniques, which I think are very useful. And then thinking about that, just the kind of training that we can provide here, because I think you know, we don't have to be data scientists, but we need to be data savvy. Um, definitely having immersion in, in other archives or other data centers is a good way to learn. Uh, there's lots of really good data management training coming up there within institutions themselves. Um, 
I think it's very important to train, particularly for data centers. I think more data centers probably should do more in training. Um, not only does it bring in better quality data, uh, it, it enables, it shows people how to use data as well. I'm very keen on the idea of linking together data centers together with institutions, and those partnerships already do exist. Um, and again, and lots of the data archives are around the, the so certainly Europe and Australia and America are providing courses and just kind of bringing, bringing alive what they do, trying to showcase what they do in a very detailed way. So, um, so that's my final slide. Yeah, thank you, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting session. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm another member of the panel, but not 100% sure I've ever counted myself as that. As a data scientist, my um, official job title is, is editor. But at the same time, I am a, a, a data publisher of um, very large-scale uh, data sets. Um, so what I and my team do, a, a lot of that does fall under this, this data science remit. Um, so I work on this project, um, Giga Science. We're, 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 a, we're a, a, a regular journal in the, the, the data publishing platform and a um, and a sort of data analysis portal. I'm employed by BGI, who are, um, um, I'm, I'm glad you and did a, a very nice uh, crash course in, in, in genomics earlier, because um, we're unfortunately one of these centers that, that are very much, um, my data's bigger than, than yours. The whole rationale for BGI is to be the, um, the, the world's largest genomics organization, um, so probably making them the largest producer of biological data in the world, producing um, you know, petabytes of, of, of data, um, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of, of, of genomes a month. Um, and um, um, as you know, representing a, a, a data producer, um, th there's been calls you know, for, for a long time for, for, for you know, new forms of credit incentives um, for, for, for data producers. And so um, uh, data publication, obviously, is, is and data citation is, 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 is a very obvious uh, uh, option here, and um, the, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, great infrastructure and, and, and moves at the moment. Um, you know, Orchid, the new data citation indexes that that, that, that are, are, are really useful here, and um, and, and useful for, for projects such as this. And um, it, it's very interesting times as well. On top of you know, on top of our our um, our journal and, and, and our platform, there's been a lot, a lot of moves in. in Recent times, lots of lots of new platforms. Um, many of them, uh, you know, taking a sort of un more unstructured data approach. And you know, there are pros and, and cons for this, but it, it's very useful. Um, that that you know, because there's so many heterogeneous da data types, these new platforms, um, you know, potentially fill lots of these gaps and, and niches and. and, and um, well, there weren't repositories, weren't mechanisms of sharing data, and it's great that they're that they're very easy to use. Um, at the same time, you know, coming from a from a data science approach, you want you want to do really cool things with this data. There are lots of talks of and lots of talk of you know, data being the new oil, and um, and, and 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 you know, uh, being such a such a precious useful resource. So you do need to do things to to maximise this, um, and so. Um, Working with with, with uh, curators, um, uh, sort of data pipeline experts, um, and, and and the like, um, uh, particularly you know, with, with such large uh, data sets, um, that you know things such as such such as cloud, um, and and the like, it, it's very important to to um, and, and as it's getting harder to, to sort of upload and download these aggregated data sets. Um, you know, pe people are following this approach that you know move the, the compute to the data. It's really important to, to, to try to think like uh, EC2 rather than Amazon S3, um, and 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 build really cool things with with these very large data sets. Um, uh, that there are lots of companies that have got uh, business models as well, to totally based on this. 23andMe, for example, uh, are making a loss on 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 the on the on this. Uh, DTC on the on the uh, direct to consumer sequencing side because they're trying to accumulate such a such a big database and there are companies such as DNA Nexus that um, they receive 15 million dollars from Google to, to sort of build build tools on top of very large you know, you know petabyte size public genomics archive so um, not only are these approaches useful for sort of downstream users that this, um, if you do see it as oil there's you know potential. Um, 
um, you know, uh, huge resources from this approach. And there are people like Atal Butte, um, you know, hypothesizing in the future that um, for, for really interesting data sets, it, it, there won't be a, a, you know, a cost to, to, uh, to, to producers or, 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 or funders for storing it, that, that the, potentially people will be paying them for, the, for their data. Um, and uh, yeah, I think publishers um, need, need to, to, to think about these issues. Um, and they really need to think about um, yeah, metadata and, 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 and uh, maximizing the use out of it. You know, this is a, I'm preaching to the converted here you know, with this audience talking about, about data, but, uh, about metadata, but it's you know, very important uh, not to forget about it. Um, so um, you know, these new, easier to use platforms, it, it's important to, to, to lower the hurdles to really streamline submission processes, but you must never totally forget about the, the, the metadata side. It's important that um, you know, submitters uh, never get the impression that it should be 100% effort-free. Oh, you know, obviously, data needs to be harvestable, searchable. It'd be good to get you know, text out of PDFs and, and things like that. So for data publishers, I think it, it'd be useful to have discussions on... So people are basically singing from the, the same uh, you know, songbook that you know, maybe there should be uh, minimal metadata standards potentially above the, the you know, uh, data site only asks for five very minimal metadata terms. Um, it, our the database, we try to, to, to do all of the optional terms as well and also capture uh, much, much richer um, metadata with formats such as isotab and the like. So there needs to be means, you know, at least means to, to capture this additional uh, data and it would be you know useful for discussions whether you get you can only get credit if you get above a certain threshold or you get additional credit for, for, for pro providing this this rich data that enables all of these cool cool things to happen downstream and it, it's important that um, you know there are, there are areas that do have um, very well established you know uh, curated resources with very rich uh, contextual information it's it's Important, particularly in these areas, that these um, new platforms don't don't um, uh, don't don't compete with them. You know, it's good that they work, that they can sort of uh, uh, complement and, 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 and work with them. But um, it, it, you know, worst case scenario, you do have the, the, you know somebody basically submits a totally amorphous blob of data that, that's not really usable. Um, on top of uh, you know, it, it's not just a, a sort of neutral thing. It ha has a neutral effect potentially if it's if it's competing and, and you know undercutting a, 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 um, a, 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 a another repository. It, it, it could potentially be you know detrimental to the to the data commons as a, as a whole. And um, it's particularly important in, in the field of genomics. Um, uh, Ewan did a, a you know a, a very good overview of how for 30 years there have been these well-established repositories. They're the people that. That know how to, you know, aggregate um, properly, curate this data. There have been um, policies. All of the, all of the, the journals um, over a decade ago signed up at these um, Bermuda and Fort Lauderdale meetings to, um, basically, you know, it, it, it's in their journal policy. They mandate submission of only certain types of genomics data, but they have to. There are only three databases that data can go to, and it's very important that. You know, data publication uh, you know, complements this, but but um, it can't repl replace it. And um, submitters need to be aware that um, this is still the case. And um, if they, you know, if people have issues with this, they need to talk to you and Bernie. They need to talk to NCBI. Um, but you know, the, the, this is where the things stand at the moment. There. Um, final thing um, I'd like to quickly mention as well is. Um, so on top of just crediting um, uh, data production, you know, coming from a real data science uh, perspective and trying to build and do cool things with the data, you should also credit re reproducibility as well. Um, one of the things we're really trying to do at Data Science is produce uh, executable research objects um, with, with, with these new you know, workflow systems, ability to really uh, you know, um, compute methods, um, uh, you know, virtual machines and the cloud, um, you can potentially, uh, you know, credit, the, credit people doing these sorts of things the same way. And in the last two weeks, we've, we've published our first paper sort of working towards this, where it's, just, you know, we have a standard sort of analysis paper pulling everything together, but we've independently 
cited all of the, the it's about 80 gigabytes of data um, that, that supported this study, and then we've also given a separate DOI, a separate kind of method citation to all of these pipelines and, and, and tools that allow the, the, the data set to be produced. And so, um, yeah, this is one thing that data science can potentially bring is the ability to think of very different shapes, publishable objects. Um, so, yeah, to conclude, really, um, I think it was uh, nice that Liz underlined the science in, in, um, in, in data science, and yeah, that's the part that people really um, shouldn't, shouldn't forget. Um, there's this ability to do uh, really, really cool, interesting things with the data, but yeah, um, people need to yeah, not, not forget about that part. So, yeah, thank you. So my name is Francine Bennett and I, I actually do call myself a data scientist because um, I, I think it's actually a brilliant title for what I've always been doing and never really had a name for before. Um, so I run a technology startup called Macedon C. Um, we provide technology and consulting services to help uh, businesses and other organisations deal effectively with their data. That usually means uh, making more profit with it, uh, it can occasionally mean, mean other kinds of value for the organisation as well. Um, and data scientist is a great term for this kind of thing because, it, although I'm slightly embarrassed to call myself a scientist because this is a room full of proper scientists, it, it expresses how, how the business sees what we do, which is, is to do something magical with their, their big load of raw data and actually uh, create some insight and some new things that they didn't know before. Um, so, most businesses have an awful lot of data now, and they're conscious that it potentially holds a bunch of value, but to them it, it looks like this. They, they just have this heap of, of stuff, uh, it's big, it's messy, anybody's telling them they need to get on board with big data, but, but they don't know quite how to do it. Um, and how I see the role of, of something like a data scientist is actually helping turn this into something useful and potentially extremely valuable to the business. So there have been a lot of headlines lately about this, um, about there being a, a talent shortage in big data. The Harvard Business Review said that data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Um, and McKinsey uh, have been telling people that uh, making use of big data is essential to any business. They said that you can increase your profits by 60% by making good use of data. So messages coming from all over the place that we need to make better use of data. Uh, data scientists are, are these magical unicorns who can actually help you to do that uh, when you're an executive or, or a business leader faced with, with a big pile of this data to deal with. Um, so the question was, what is a data scientist? And I think, um, as, as a few of you have already said, that there isn't really a specific career path as such for those people. And I, I think that's not necessarily such a problem, um, because the main things that, in my view, a data scientist needs are not necessarily formal trainings, but it's, it's actually certain characteristics. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what those are. Um, and the first one that, that I see is, is really a lot of curiosity. So as a data scientist, um, we, we work with lots of different uh, different types of data and different problems all the time. Uh, so you need to be very curious, you need to like change, you need to like learning about new models. Um, the problem that you're presented with rarely is uh, identical to one you've had before, so it's important to fit your approach to the data rather than insisting on, on hitting things in a particular way every time. And you also need an amount of humility. Um, things can mess up really badly sometimes, uh, sometimes systems don't work, sometimes the data doesn't have the insights in it that you need it to have, um, and you need to be able to admit that. But you also need quite a lot of hubris to, to go out and try and do this stuff to start with, to, to say, yes, I, I can give you the insights which, which will uh, do wonderful things for your organisation. So, so you need a balance of, of both, and, and not to be destroyed when it all goes wrong, um, and also, but also not to always assume that everything will, will work. And finally, really, um, I think data scientists need an awful lot of pragmatism. Um, so in my day to day, um, we're usually using a set of open source technologies called Hadoop. 
Um, sometimes we're not, sometimes we use other tools. Um, I have to be comfortable working across different tool sets depending on what's needed and dealing with uh, gaps in data, dealing with uh, very large, very small data sets, just working around the constraints of what tools and resources we have um, rather than needing things to be set up in, in a particular way or needing a particular type of situation to start with. Um, so I can see a few, few nodding heads and a few shaking heads, so I, I think we'll, we'll get a, a little bit of feedback on this topic in a moment. Um, but that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. All right. <laughs> So while um, the, the panel are moving their seats into um, the middle here, I hope you're all thinking about what reflections you're going to share with us. Um, because now it's the uh, discussion, it's really over to you. Um, we've heard some fascinating um, perspectives uh, on a data scientist. And what I'd like um, to hear is whether you agree with them. Um, do they um, synergize with, with what you do? Um, what are the things we need to really um, grab hold of and identify as actions that the community needs to get on with, uh, whether it's the DCC, the Research Data Alliance, or, or some other body, um, so that we can move this um, space forward. So um, we've got uh, three, I think, roving mics, uh, and um, I'd like to ask you to uh, say your name and institution um, uh, before you um, Speak. So, um, without further ado, I'll move my seat to two. I might even come down, actually, um, a la opera. Uh, and uh, who, who's going to kick us off? Who's got a question? Okay, wonderful. Hi, uh, Mark Hannell, Big Share. Um, my question is that the topic is what is a data scientist and what have you. And there's lots of different jobs that we've talked about here. But is a data scientist not just the person who analyzes the data, mines the data, visualizes the data, and then everything else is a different job. But when we, people say we need <coughs> X amount of data scientists, it's because there's too much data out there that we need people to actually be analyzing the data. And so that's, for me, what a data scientist is. And everything else is important, but they're just kind of around the data scientists. Okay, well, um, we might, well, anyone, to, who agrees with that statement? <laughs> Who disagrees with that statement? <laughs> I might disagree with it, I think. Um, okay, um, who would like to make a comment on, on that? Um... Hi, Kayla. Kayla Thaney from Digital Science. I think to pick up on that as well, a lot of the discussions, and I also, as uh, Paul Miller referenced today, um, co-organize an event with O'Reilly Media on data and data science called Strata. Uh, and what we found is really as this is rapidly evolving that even just thinking, and I think Mark is onto something that the people that analyze and, and work with the data as a data scientist, but to also caution not to, not to interpret that all too narrowly, because what I find so, so wonderful about the people that are coming forward and saying that they're doing data science and they're <coughs> everyday uh, jobs or in their everyday research, is this curiosity paired with you know a couple of the technical tools and some domain expertise, but that still is a rather broad definition when you think about the disciplines of you know say data curation in a library sense or, or whatnot. And so to not try to stifle that too much. Hans Heidenberg from the Altbienen Institute for Cola Marine Research, of which half are uh, or half of its uh, researchers are biologists, by the way and most of the rest are geologists and so on. Uh, and so I would like to comment on, on, on the four panelists. I, I had thought, I have seen, uh, oh, yeah, I've read about a definition for a data scientist uh, within, uh, from the National Science Board, the US National Science Board. And I think Francine's uh, description of her work is most like what was from the uh, US uh, Science Board in that she helps people doing their business. So I would expect that a data scientist is with our research groups at the institute. I don't know how many of them we need. And this helping the biologists to get on with their data, to make the most of their data. So maybe one uh, data scientist per 10 or 20 scientists, a biologist, would be good for us. Uh, which is not to say that the other job descriptions are not needed. I'm going to 
ask the panel, who would like to uh, respond to that one? I agree with all of you, and my sort of argument is that probably as a data creator, we're not data scientists. I certainly don't see myself as a, as a data scientist, although I've analysed huge data sets, relatively huge data sets in the past. I'm a chemist by training, I've manipulated a lot of data, but I don't see myself in that role. But I still think it's important to have one, actually, who can do some of those, that analytic work, and can work with scientists, can, can reach out to, to challenge some of their problems, whether it be through helping prepare data in a certain way or harmonise data or link data. I, I think that role is very important. But, and I think it's good for us, our kind of sense, to have at least one person that can help with that. Although I don't think we're quite there with a Hadoop and, and the, the bigger data, but I think those skills are very important. So I'm quite interested to explore how um, some of the other roles um, interact <coughs> with um, the data analyst, for example. And I'm seeing lots of hands up. Um, so I think we'll... we'll Go over to Sheila and then, and then you've also got your hand up. So. Sheila Carroll, uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Information Scientists. Um, I was quite interested when I read the Harvard Business Review article to see the term data scientist <laughs> being used in that context. Because up until now I had tended to associate data scientists with uh, uh, people working in typically scientific disciplines, even though that could be interpreted quite broadly. And, and I think, um, I'm not sure that I find it very helpful to use data scientists for these sort of business roles. And certainly in our own school, um, we, we had a colloquium of big data recently, and it was quite interesting, the different interpretations within the school of what big data were. And um, in, coming from my end of the spectrum, which is the library and information science, I mean, we, we, we naturally gravitated towards the sort of the scholarly end of the spectrum. And the people in our information science and technology program, interestingly, didn't talk about anything but data and business. That's all they talked about. And they, they don't use the term data science there, or data scientists. They, they talk about data analytics all the time. And that's their, their thing. And they have a data analytics track. Um, one of the things that reminded me of hearing this discussion was the way that the term information scientist became, was hijacked and lost its original meaning, because that term started out as being uh, used to describe scientists who then became specialists in information. And then, uh, gradually, all sorts of people started calling themselves information scientists, basically because they thought they were upmarket word as librarian. And, uh, and, and it sort of lost its um, distinction, really, um, as being a, a different type of role um, I don't think it's more upmarket than library necessarily because you can get uh, you know, highly specialist work done in libraries as well. But I think the, the, the difference there was that the information scientist would normally be something who would do more of the analytical work, uh, more analyzing information rather than, than, than simply um, um, identifying it and uh, doing things like summarizing. Um, you need to have some understanding of the subject that you're at a deeper level. And personally, I think it's not terribly helpful to use data scientists in such a very broad way, because I think it would be more helpful to have it more akin to the original information scientist role and, and have a word uh, related to data analytics for these other jobs, which seem to me that's where the emphasis seems to be. Okay, fantastic. Okay, um, <coughs> should be on, yeah. Okay, so David Massa from D Solution. Um, and when I work for a small company where we help people to uh, actually aggregate data and prepare them so they can be analyzed by uh, people, maybe, um, data scientists. But what I want to say, though, so, so for, for me, I don't think we are data scientists, but data scientists are really the people who uh, analyze the data, statisticians, or try to make sense of it. And I, so I, it's really this, Way I see, but I, I think also it's really at the moment all these um, analysis of data. It's really something tough and difficult, and I have the feeling it's also it's not going to stay. So that the software is going to be developed and tools that will really automate this job, and that I mean these well the role of these people will disappear in a in a few years. Okay, so that, that's an interesting point. Um, I'll ping back to the panel. Um, yep, yeah. I actually yeah. kind of wanted to go back just a little bit because what I was hearing when um, Liz asked the first question of, um, you know, do you agree and is this data science? And what I was hearing was people were identifying data science as 
it was confined to data analysis. And that's what I was hearing from the people that were talking, in which case, can we just call it a data analyst? Um, but what I heard from the last person that was speaking was that there was something more where he was talking about having a data scientist embedded with the team and doing more than the analysis, but helping the, the scientist, the researcher, with the organization and formatting of the data, which to me brings back to that's a library role. When we teach people how to organize information. Um, we teach people, you know, we, we metadata. I mean, I can't think of anyone that's better at figuring out which metadata and control vocabulary and how to access and find information than librarians. So I, I'm still not clear on what it is. Is it just the analysis or is there more to it than that? I'll stop there. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm Kathy Peek from the University of Bath, and my job description is actually data scientist, and I think what I do is actually pretty much what Steph does, and I loved her description of the data concierge and trying to achieve the impossible, because that's what I feel like on a daily basis. But I was wondering, I think I actually have two roles. Part of my role is um, more of a data manager. We work in research data management, so I am a data manager in that I'm a central person in the university, and I have to kind of translate between the researchers, senior management, and different people, so I'm a focal person. But the other side of my role, I still, I'm a biologist by training, so I, I was a scientist, and I feel like I still have a research role in, it's, this is a new area, and we're still trying to work out what we're doing, so I feel like I'm also trying to do research. So part of my role I feel is a data manager, and part of my role I feel is a data scientist, and I'm exploring and researching in how we use data and manage data. Can I pick up on this, this sort of hybridity, if that's a word? Um, how, how many people think that they are uh, a data something or other, but they've also um, been a research researcher? Can, does that make sense? So there's quite a lot of you, actually. Could I ask um, so, uh, a few of you to you know, expand on, on how you see your hybrid skills um, building on this? Um, Hi, Tom Parsons from the University of Nottingham. Um, I mean, originally I was a biochemist and then moved into information systems, come on the bioinformatics route possibly. But I, uh, I do see the data scientist as someone who's very good at analysing data. Um, I think there's going to be a huge call for them in the future because if you, I mean, if all the RCDK mandates are met, then you've got limited data sets out there. No one really skilled enough to analyze it and bring it all together. So, I'm wondering, is that something that's being addressed? Okay, so um, that's a good point. Um, so, this is thinking about skills like R, maybe R analysis using R, uh, tools yeah. like R. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly in the social science and economics world, there's been a recognition of the huge deficit of quantitative researchers. Uh, and the ESLC, the funding council for that domain, has put a lot of money into quantitative methods, um, training, capacity building, um, and uh, quite a lot of startup projects to help people demonstrate the value of, of quantitative methods in, in undergraduate degrees. So we've been very aware of the skills shortage for some time. We're trying to create really highly qualified quantitative methods people. And I think, I think it's working. There, there is a need for that, and we do need that. I'm Dave Drum from Johns Hopkins University. I'm going to chime in on the hybrid role because I'm currently a data management specialist in consulting for data management planning. But I came to, back to library school after getting a PhD in sociology, and you know, <coughs> trust, trust, you know, not in sociology somehow by finding a way to use some of those skills in interviewing and also analyzing practices and cultures of different scientific fields has been useful in my, my field. So um, not so much the number crunching side of things, but it really helps with my understanding of, of the context of the people we're working on and trying to get up to speed with more quickly. We've got some other hybrids. People have got cross backgrounds, if you see what I mean. I wanted to pick up on the um, on the, the ways in which people move from, from one sort of area to another. Um, I mean, a long, long, long time ago, I was also a biologist. 
Um, so I've made a, a, a transition. Okay, it was a long time ago, but I was. Um, uh, and so I've worked in a lab. Um, and, and I wanted to uh, explore um, what, how do we feel as a community? Do we feel we should be encouraging people to do that? So to move from a, a, a research discipline, a p sort of pure researcher role, into an informatics role, for want of a better way of framing it. And if we believe that, how, how as a community do we think we can um, uh, enhance that process? How can we make it happen? Because there's this shortage of, of people, whatever we call them, um, to, to do stuff with data, whether it's looking after it, whether it's analysing it, storing it, um, what, whatever. How as a community, what, what actions do you think we need to take um, to, to build this uh, data community? Hi, Caitlin from Digital Science Camp. I think to a certain extent, depending on the disciplines, if you're going along with the example that you just gave, um, to a certain extent, it's, you know, competition will sort a lot of that out. If people are dealing with lots of information in, in their counterpart in another lab that is competing for the same publication is upping their game when it comes to analytics, um, they're either going to compete or, you know, be left behind. But I think in general for, I mean, a lot of the researchers that we deal with outside of some of the more adept disciplines or ones that are dealing with massive amounts of information, what we're finding is that the, the level of awareness and just statistical literacy, you know, data management, being able to understand that this information should be, um, at the example I gave uh, at lunch was, it's like telling a teenager they don't have to clean their room until they're 15. Like, if they're not, if their defaults aren't set, and in this day and age, I mean, especially with things like QuickShare and GitHub and a lot of the other tools that were referenced today from the digital libraries and things, it's really easy for people to do these things, but it's not baked into their process and they're not provided with other additional um, resources, whether they're in a startup or they're an undergraduate student who you know, could better understand the environment that they're sitting in and why this is important, but we're not updating curriculum and also not providing additional training. So I think that some sort of skills training, and I know this is a, a hot topic in a number of different areas, and I've had this conversation with politicians and policymakers and biomedical funders and research institutions and researchers themselves and those that are involved in the startup communities that there's a, gener a general level of awareness that some people are happy to go off and train themselves or to seek those resources on their own, but for others they're, they're at a bit of a disadvantage by not having just that basic training there so they can at least understand what the information and basic data visualization and things uh, can do for them. Um, it's Hans again, and I just wanted to say, Liz, you, you asked uh, how we describe this thing, what they are about to do. I want to say, well, mainly we in this room, I guess, are service people, uh, to be honest. And uh, in part, naming one of us a data scientist is, of course, upscaling the thing. And the point is here, you are asking, uh, will we uh, uh, encourage people to become, to become <coughs> Uh, data scientists, and I say, well, yes, of course, uh, there should be a ro role for them because there will always be people in each uh, research group who will be happy to do these things we are talking about more than doing the basic uh, biology or basic uh, geology or something. Uh, we, we know all these people and they need to find uh, a proper job description and be and get the respect for that. So it's okay to say, well, prepare for that job. On the other hand, we need to make sure that they find a job. Just related to that, um, this gentleman a little while ago said that uh, he thought the need for data scientists would go away in a few years because the tools would get so good that you wouldn't need them. And I, I don't think that's true at all, actually. Um, from, from my perspective, uh, it, tools are developing and that's wonderful and um, additional support things like GitHub which make it very easy to, to collaborate and to build on things. And that just takes out boring parts of my work and uh, lets us do more advanced things. It also lowers the barriers to entry for people who feel less happy about opening our studio. So um, I think better tools uh, will enable more people to do these things more powerfully, um, but they won't obviate the need for data scientists later on. I am I'm William Wright from the DPC. And I've been thinking about actually what Sheila said about the, how 
words and names come into vogue and then pass through vogue. And it reminded me actually of a series of interviews I did in around 2002. Okay, so if someone came to me with informa or, you know, information scientists or data scientists as their current job description and applied to me for a job because they were an information or a data scientist, I have to say I would be quite skeptical. And I would want to know what that meant. <coughs> and I remember interviews in around 2002 where we had a whole field of candidates who at that time all called themselves knowledge managers. That might have been the fashion in 2002. And each one of them we asked, well, what's a knowledge manager? Because I didn't know. And, and it seems to me, if I can just be speculate for a moment, that information or data scientist, I suppose I have two problems with data scientist as a term. I don't know what the data is, and I don't know what the scientist is, and it leaves me slightly anxious that if these people aren't actually also postdocs with good degrees in biology or former archaeologists who don't like the rain, that you know there has to be a core to what it is they do. And, and if I don't, as an employer, looking at applications, if I don't understand what their current job is, then it's going to be difficult for me to employ that person confidently without you know, going over this a great deal of time. And I'll finish this ramble with one uh, free advert, if I may. I'm thinking about this just now because we are recruiting, and DPC will be advertising a post in the next uh, week or so. And, you know, uh, this is the thoughts that are going through my own mind as I can think about who it is we're looking for. What would I think if someone came and said they're a data scientist? And I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I quite share William's uh, scepticism there. Well, perhaps I share a scepticism that many of the people who come to him with job titles like knowledge managers or whatever if you press, uh, there's not a lot to discover there. But, but I think there's no question that there are people uh, whose primary skill is not in any particular domain of research, but in knowing how to do interesting stuff with data. And I, and I, I would define those data scientists, and we know they do exist. There was an article, indeed, trying to make this point in New Scientist just before Christmas, I've been trying to find the, the, the link here, who, with minimal domain knowledge, can make discoveries given enough data. Uh, because they know how to find these out. And, and actually, we've been accepting for years, for instance, that we've got statisticians who, again, will have the same set of skills who, although many statisticians will end up specialising in particular areas, in general, they ought to be able to tell you things about your data without themselves having much domain knowledge. Anyone like to comment on that? Um, statisticians? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to go back to... Oh, yeah. It's maybe not quite what you're looking for, Liz, but I mean, I'm not disagreeing with, with, with Kevin, and I think he's absolutely right. I think actually that's helped clarify that considerably for me, uh, what, that, what that role actually is. Uh, and I think we need to hold on to that definition as, <laughs> as much as we can, because I think that, that helps a lot. There are people with those generic, as it were, skills who could come to any data set and provide some sort of uh, analysis. Uh, and I think, I'm, I'm not denying their existence, I'm just anxious about its deployment in the uh, Thanks, it's uh, Sheila Carl again, just coming back and picking up on some of the recent contributions. Um, um, I, I completely agree with uh, William about knowledge management because, um, I mean, that's a term that just means all things to all people and it's another sort of a term that's um, an upmarket name for something more basic and uh, you probably enjoy reading the article by my former colleague Tom Wilson called The Nonsense of Knowledge Management. Um, but coming back to the question of these hybrid roles, um, I think I would draw a distinction between the person who um, is, is somebody with uh, a background in the discipline and then moves into a more specialist role where they're essentially acting as the data specialist for their team. And I would still tend to call that sort of person a data scientist if that's the sort of field in which they're working. I think somebody um, some years ago also suggested that there might be a data humanist role uh, uh, some, somewhere in the future as well. Um, I think the other people who are just the people who have a lot of expertise in data, I mean, we could call them um, data analysts, but I mean, their role may be broader than just analysis, so maybe they could be data specialists, and we did have a time when we talked about information specialists too. Um, but thinking about the training question, which I think somebody um, did sort of raise, uh, training and education, um, the, the parallel I, I can see here is, is the discussion about 10 years ago when people were 
concerned that there was a need for specialist roles in the um, medical field and uh, it was recognised that the idea of clinical librarians being people who could provide sort of on-the-spot specialist support um, to uh, clinicians um, had not really worked and so there was the idea of this new role called an informationist but uh, different from clinical librarians, it was, it was uh, um, proposed at that time that these people could either be uh, people with a library background who then received some specialist training in the biomedical field in which they were working, or they could be biomedical people who received a sort of crash course in uh, the information sciences in order to give them that hybrid qualification and understanding. Now, it's not really taken off in a big way. There are people, particularly in the United States, who, who are called informationists, but I don't think that the, the, the widespread development of um, courses in that area that was envisaged, and certainly the original proposers, um, I think it was sort of Annals of Internal Medicine, where the original article was published, the original proposers did actually um, suggest that these people um, should eventually be accredited by some body that was set up and also that they should report up the um, clinical line rather than into the information function in their organisation. So there may be a parallel there that can be revisited. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just just like to comment on the, the role of people coming in with kind of data skills into a centre like ours. Um, the people who deal with data on a day daily basis are data managers and certainly not data scientists or the one that wants to call themselves a data scientist and we don't agree that they are so we're arguing with their terminology ourselves. Um, most of them have come in, they're, they're, they have to open data, they have to you know, check the variables, they have to do integrity checks, they're, they're working you know, with, it, with the data set. Most of them come in, um, they've done PhDs, they've been quite, not to generalise too much, but most of them have been quite disenchanted with, with academia and actually don't particularly want to go the academic route or don't like writing up, you know, they don't like reports, they don't like the, you know, the, the rat race. And they, they've come to us kind of by de default because of the job that requires those skills and they've ended up staying and picking up the skills and they're actually moving on to very good jobs afterwards as data managers, as data curators. And I'm sure that's probably the case in, in other centres that you have highly skilled people that just don't want to follow that research route. They don't like the rain or they don't like the labs. And actually, if we look at some of the epidemiology studies um, in the UK and some of the clinical trials data managers, they've also ended up there by default in that they've done some, you know, done PhD, they've done some early career research and decided they're very good, they like the data side and they've, been, they've adopted that role as data managers, but they haven't been trained in that role. So it seems to be a, a pathway that happens by itself, but whether we should, you know, precipitate it or not is, is different. Perhaps we should. <coughs> So I wanted to um, pick up on this um, core curriculum uh, idea um, because we, we sort of talked, we've, we've explored some different skills. Um, I think we've acknowledged that training is needed. Would anyone like to um, say a few words about how we might achieve, um, I, I, I call it a core curriculum for, for data science if such a thing exists, or whether there are core elements to um, uh, some training that we need to um, focus on, uh, or a minimal set of, of skills. Would anyone like to um, comment on initiatives that perhaps they're involved with, or um, degree programs that they're developing, master's programs, or national initiatives? Um, are we doing enough in that area? Um, we are at the University of North Texas. We are revising one portion of our curriculum specifically around this data, um, these data needs, and we used um, competency analysis from position current descriptions um, in the field to design the curriculum. The thing that I worry about is, as we've done that, you know, is it, are, are those, you know, the types of jobs that are going to be advertised in another few years going to change again? You know, it goes back to the, the question, you know, how much of this is is perhaps a passing fad? How much is, of it is going to persist? But we are redesigning our, our core curriculum of the IS program around these, the, you know, uh, a competency-based analysis of the new positions. 
Just a quick comment. Um, listening to some academics in the States talk about these programs that are coming up and at least being adjusted. And one interesting uh, story was at Berkeley. The gentleman I was speaking to was aware of three, this was last year around this time, was aware of three separate data science initiatives that were being put together at the university, one in the CS department, one bringing together people in the healthcare and life sciences side of things, and one with those that were working in maths. Um, because, you know, so much of this comes from statistics and from maths and things like that. And I asked him, you know, is that just too much? And he goes, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see. You know, they were all keeping abreast of what everyone was doing, but there were different levels of interest and different levels of awareness and, and skill that they were trying to build off of. And so I don't, it, it, I think it'll be interesting to see in about a year or two, you know, whether or not it, to try to measure the successes and compare the programs and, and the pedagogy between. Hi, Joyce Ray from Johns Hopkins University, and um, I've been doing some looking at what's been developed and is being developed in the U.S. Uh, because I'm helping Hopkins to develop a new, uh, it's a post-master's certificate of advanced study in digital curation, and these have become pretty common actually in schools of library and information science in the U.S. Um, they do seem to have kind of a common uh, core curriculum. Uh, and what I think is really interesting is I think that a lot of them have been influenced by the Digital Curation Center, uh, and that's why they're using the term digital and data curation. And I was interested in seeing where that term came from. You know, the earliest uses or you know, times it was mentioned, and there was a report uh, from a meeting that was at Centerpoint in London, and I think you were there, Liz, uh, if I recall. <laughs> it was maybe around 2000, and it was the same kind of conversation going on about the term digital curation, or I think it was digital curation, maybe some data curation, but um, as I recall from that, there was a big discussion about, well, are there underlying principles that would make a core of the digital, you know, curator's job. And there was one person who, um, you know, objected strongly, somebody that came from, I think, the biological sciences, where there were services going on where they already had people that were called um, curators. And so that person disagreed with everyone else that, who seemed to feel like, yes, there were some core principles that were kind of cross disciplines. And my understanding was that this report maybe kind of was the basis for the justification that started the Digital Curation Center. So I'm kind of wondering, it seems like it's taken a long time for that term to be more accepted. And so, like, why is it now that's not good? And, you know, data scientists is good and, uh, and that's better or something. So I don't quite understand the transition, but it sounds like a lot of the same kind of discussion. Yeah. Uh, it might have been the um, Philip Lord report, um, uh, 2003, where I can envisage being around a table, I think it was in Centre Point, um, with some people from EBI, I think Tony Hay was there, um, and, and colleagues, um, and, and that's and it was out of that meeting, I think, or at least partly out of that meeting. There was a report produced which talked about um, digital curation, and it was immediately after that that um, the notion of the DCC um, emerged, um, uh, and it was linked to the whole e-science movement as well in, in the UK, um, funded by uh, EPSLC. Okay, I think that's an interesting point, and, and things do go in cycles, there's no doubt about that. Um, I'm looking to um, colleagues on, on the podium, I'm very aware that time is moving on, and um, I'm going to ask Cliff to um, sum up uh, in about a few minutes' time. So, um, ask um, colleagues on, on the um, podium whether they'd like to make any comments. And I know there's a lot of you who haven't said anything. Are there any burning issues you'd like to chuck into this discussion? And uh, for me, um, I, I think there's scope to um, identify some actions coming uh, out of this discussion. 
So if you can frame your comments in, in terms of what actions we should take, and, and perhaps it's the DCC needs to do something, perhaps it's um, uh, iSchools need to do something, uh, perhaps it's um, uh, the Research Data Alliance needs to do something, uh, that would be really helpful so that we can um, move this forward. So, um, would anyone like to have a, a, a last word from the, from the floor, from, from the panel first? No. I don't know that I want to be the last one, but um, so one thing that I've been chewing on here is uh, we've been talking about um, the definition of data scientist and whether you need to have a domain background or whether it's um, the library background. And it seems to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any programs that are offering data science curriculum outside of iSchools. So that to me indicates that that's kind of the basis of where this is coming from. There are, there are, are there some, some others? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but Business they, schools. Yeah. Business schools. Business okay. schools. Okay. Stats, Matt, yeah. See, and that's just my limited. Okay. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I wanted to get to in terms of what you were saying as far as um, things that need to be done, at least in terms of services provided through the libraries, is that stuff that we offer is driven by research needs, and research needs are driven basically, um, and I'm simplifying this, but by the tenure promotion process and funders. And so I was um, greatly heartened when I saw that the NSF has changed its guidelines recently so that in biographical sketches for um, grant proposals, you can include data sets as research outputs, which I think is a step in the right direction towards um, making that a more important issue. So stop there. Yeah, just in terms of training, I think any any institution that's taking forward, you know, data management training and there's a lot of really good things going on, it's very important to have the domain expertise linked in. And there's some good examples of that in Southampton where you've got you're almost training up those champions in each department to take on some of those curation rules and their in those curation kind of expertise in, in their own departments and faculties. So it may be that you have a hub and spokes model where you're relying on these individuals or the next individual after that to, to have that kind of curation role, and I'm not sure what their term would be, but they need to be involved in, in the curation of the department's um, live data. But I think that's a really useful way to go, so you can then draw on the expertise of those. I just wanted to add to the comments about education as well. So my original background was, uh, my undergrad was maths and philosophy, and I dropped applied maths like a hot potato as soon as I could because I found it boring beyond belief, because all I, I learned was the formulae for calculating the line of best fit and regression. had no idea of the applications of all this stuff until about 10 years later. So I was a, a strategy consultant for a, for a number of years, and built these ridiculous uh, machines in Excel to, to, do, to do things before I learned how to program and how to do this stuff hands-on and, and realized the, the value of it. So I, I think in terms of education, that the best thing you can do for people whether they're going uh, an academic or a commercial route later on, is to actually expose them uh, to, to hands-on experience of applying uh, these tools and techniques to data. And I don't think you need to teach people any particular tools. It's more about igniting the passion and, and the understanding of the potential of doing this at, at an earlier age. Um, yeah, so it's been obvious from, from the presentations and the comments that it's been very difficult to define uh, you know, what is a data scientist, um, where, where is it going. Um, it's such, obviously, such a, a rapidly uh, growing area, things are changing so, so quickly, and um, uh, it, it's you know, multi domain and, and, and spans so many areas. So, yeah, for traditional courses, it's very difficult to, to, to really. You know, talking about thinking about training and, and the like, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to really slot it into lots of um, uh, classical courses. But obviously, um, you know, DCC and organisations such as this, and um, and the curation community are very well placed um, for the future. Yeah. Would anyone from the floor who hasn't spoken like to have a, a word? I'm more in the management space rather than uh, you know. Uh, a data scientist or anything, but I think of it as um, if I'm going out looking for uh, an employee, what, what is it that's accepted outside, what's the accepted term for, for data scientists, 
it seems that there is a, a pretty good understanding out there of it. Um, it's sort of vague in certain spaces, but that's, that to me would sort of help define that, because that's what I go and look for, I and mean, the skills that's associated with that. The same for a person in time, inside the organisation, they'd want to be accepted for what they are. So what is it that's accepted as a standard understanding of that, of that particular term? And maybe, you know, when we sort of talk about some of these other descriptions, maybe it's a little bit different when you need a new term, and then that sort of needs to coalesce and mature. If it's not mature enough, then, you know, it's, it's very difficult, I suppose, to still get that recognition anyway. Wendy Roy, University of Southampton. Just to follow on from what Louise was saying about what we're doing, um, I think we haven't really discussed terminology at all, so I'm going to go away now and be really worried that we haven't had this crucial conversation. Um, but I think we'd say that we're still at the stage where we're really just learning from each other about each other's skills and what we're contributing. So, um, you know, over the last couple of years, I think we felt librarians have been learning from our PhD community, have been learning from our very experienced PIs with disciplinary expertise. And all of that is, is coming together. And it's a long, iterative process in terms of us, you know, getting rich understanding of each other's roles. But that's, you know, that's the start of our journey. And I, I don't think we're too worried about the names just yet. Maybe I think that comes down the line where we feel comfortable about, uh, about where we've got to. Thanks, Wendy. Hi, I'm Cheryl Thompson from the University of Illinois. And I just wanted to make a comment that um, I know we're debating about what a data scientist is, but it might be interesting to approach that question from looking at the graduates of the different programs that we have um, in data curation, data science, data analytics. Um, so that might be interesting to do sort of some alumni surveys or interviews to find out what kind of roles and job duties they have. Well, it's been an interesting discussion. I mean, to a certain extent, I was being devil's advocate. Um, in um, setting this one. Um, it, it's illustrated for me, the, it has still illustrated for me a diversity of roles. Um, I think we do have a shortage of them, all of them, probably. Uh, and um, as a community, we need to address how we develop people to fill those roles, because I do believe there will be jobs um, going forward. And, and a real demand for um, individuals who can um, act as part of research teams or part of commercial teams or part of what, publisher teams uh, and do stuff with data, whatever that stuff is. And so for me, um, I'm certainly going to take back um, some thinking about how we can uh, perhaps um, start to um, uh, concretize, if that's a word, um, uh, these skills, these skill sets, so that we can um, develop uh, training uh, and, and um, professional development courses um, to build capacity in the community. So with that, I'd like us to thank our uh, panel of speakers and um, thank you all as an audience for engaging uh, with uh, this um, topic. Thanks. <laughs>